Today, uh, very exciting um, endometriosis get together again. Um, in my lab, uh, we are trying to understand human endometrium by using single cell genomics, and we develop organ like structures to also uh, develop model systems where we can study um, how a healthy endometrium functions and also what happens when there is a disease. And, um, the reason that the emphasis that I will highlight here today on human understanding human endometrium is because human uterus is not mouse uterus. So like I'm a basic scientist, we do a lot of things in a reductionist setting, but when it comes to the biology of endometrium, biology of uterus, we really need human models. And so with that uh, in mind, uh, we uh, have been developing uh, reductionist and clinically relevant models to understand uh, the biology of endometrium and uh, you know this is uh, something that just to highlight anatomical differences uh, between mouse and uh, human setting uh, and you know we can cure many diseases in mice my lab studies cancer but in order to cure a pathology that's very unique to uh, human biology we need to use human systems so with that in mind uh, we uh, created a um, network of scientists in Greater New York area uh, to be able to generate a Rosetta Stone, a map for human endometrium, and that has an emphasis for patients across diverse ancestries because most of the uh, genomics data in uh, humans exists from, um, unfortunately, one or two dominant ancestries like European ancestry, and so. Um, uh, we put together a team of clinicians, community engagement specialists, clinical researchers, and computational biologists, and received a human cell atlas uh, grant from Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to uh, make a Rosetta Stone of endometrium. So this is preliminary results from um, uh, the initial cohort of patients that we were able to profile. So these patients, uh, these patient specimens are um, analyzed one cell at a time to uh, make up a dictionary of endometrial cell types. And so endometrium undergoes several different uh, physiological processes during uh, different uh, stages of uh, a woman's lifespan. And so that creates a lot of heterogeneity. Um, we try to uh, put that uh, uh, variable in our studies, but we need hundreds and hundreds of uh, samples to be able to uncouple uh, what are the cell states in particular stage of the menstrual cycle versus premenopause or postmenopausal setting? So I highlighted some of the major cell types that are you know shared in our cohort and also in the other uh, data sets that are out there. And then when we look at the uh, chromatin accessibility, meaning that the epigenetic state of the cell that uh, dictates that dictates the uh, uh, overall sorry that dictates the overall uh, 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 gene expression program, uh, we can see a uh, different composition of cells across diverse uh, demographics. And one thing that's striking in this map that we are generating is, depending on the type of the patient, you see diversity of the cells that are represented. Some of them probably are biological, some of them are also driven by uh, various other uh, factors. But what, is this, what this really helps us is to define also factors they determine the functional states of the cells, and these are called transcription factors. So some of these things are known from the past work, and most of the things are actually unknown. So by generating this catalog, we are now able to zoom in into individual cell subsets within human endometrium and understand what are the key determinants of that functional cell state. And for a disease like endometriosis, it starts in a cell like that. It starts within a cell or a cell network within the endometrium, and then things go wrong. So before we understand how and why and uh, you know, in what uh, order of events things are going wrong, it's important to understand what are the drivers of the normal developmental programs. And so uh, the normal biology is important to understand the disease. And you know, endometrium has a lot of uh, uh, concerning uh, disease states. Endometriosis is one of them. It's a very common one. But another disease that I want to discuss today with you that also requires a lot of attention is endometrial cancer. 
It's increasing in both incidence and mortality. You can see here, it's right now the number one cancer type. It surpassed ovarian cancer and other cancer types in its rate of mortality. So it's killing, and its rate of killing is increasing every year. And its incidence is also increasing. So we developed a, a comprehensive biobank of patients uh, with you know, normal looking endometrium and, and, uh, and uh, across the spectrum of endometrial cancer pathology. And so we have uh, more than 300 patients in our biobank and we have created another consortium to look at that problem from the most comprehensive way. We have done whole genome sequencing of most of our patients from diverse ancestries. This is also very important because there are uh, significant healthcare disparities when it comes to endometrial cancer incidence and mortality and response to therapy, where African-American women suffer disproportionately uh, worse compared to other ancestries. So we developed this uh, uh, whole genome sequencing map here. I'm just showing you, uh, 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 you know, like what it looks like. We see common drivers like P53 and RID1A in them, but there are also unique, gene expre uh, unique genetic mutations uh, that we can uh, define from our cohort. To understand functionally how these things may influence the disease itself, we developed organoids from uh, uh, normal, matched normal, and also uh, uh, different uh, subtypes of endometrial cancer, uh, including the rare subtypes that are not very easy to uh, uh, come by. And uh, one of these rare subsets is called carcinosarcoma. So carcinosarcoma is an important disease for me to highlight for endometriosis uh, crowd because it is actually similar in nature. It is a cancer type that harbors both uh, 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 carcinoma, which it means like normal, epi like uh, an epithelial cell uh, that ha has uh, gone towards oncogenic transformation, and a sarcoma, which means like a mesenchymal cell that has undergone oncogenic transformation, and hence the name carcinosarcoma. And so we wanted to study this disease because it is the most deadly, one of the most deadly types of endometrial cancer. It has this biphasic nature, so kind of schizophrenic nature. And also it's very rare in European ancestry, but much more common and deadly in African ancestry. So to do that, we have done a, a, a genomics and single cell genomics uh, approach where we collected specimens from patients across diverse ancestries. And as you can see, majority of our patients are from African ancestry. And then we have done single cell analysis to define cellular heterogeneity. And here you can see that the cellular heterogeneity of carcinosarcoma is remarkable. Both within the patient, the cancer is very heterogeneous. It has mesenchymal-like cells, epithelial-like cells, and cancer stem cells. So you can see here, these are across patients, and these are the markers. And so to read this is, you know, if it's more red, it means more present for the particular gene, and if it's blue, it means less. And the fact that you see a mix of blue and uh, red is telling you that it's not homogeneous, it's heterogeneous. And then here you can see the distribution of expression within the patient. So there is high degree of heterogeneity. And when it comes to cancer, high degree of heterogeneity is bad for the patient. Because when you're trying to treat the disease with chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or other targeted therapies, there is a lot of room for this cancer to escape because it has a lot of heterogeneity. And so this is a big problem, and so we are now trying to figure out, can we define new targets by using the gene expression data sets and the genetic data sets and the organoids? So we took advantage of uh, our normal and diseased uh, uh, gene expression programs to define cancer-specific uh, pathways and targets. And we found some interesting ones listed here, some transcription factors such as CREP pathway and its uh, friends, targetable transcription factors are selectively enriched in carcinosarcoma and also some metabolic pathways. So we are now doing experiments to show that these are uh, potentially and, uh, 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 interesting targets that can uh, provide a therapeutic advantage. And so we have done uh, the organoid models, we have expanded these models, and we are part of an NCI-driven, National Cancer Institute-driven consortium to generalize these models, to give it to other cancer researchers. And so these models, hopefully will be very soon available to the general cancer community. They will be distributed by uh, ATCC. So my lab contributed 15 of these models that are highly well characterized with great QC. So uh, our hope to generalize these models and more people can use them to discover uh, targets and help uh, the patients who are suffering from, the, the, from this deadly disease. 
And so we can uh, expand these long term, do um, uh, uh, genomics. In this case, we didn't do whole uh, genome. We did exome sequencing to show that there's high concordance between the primary tissue sample and the, uh, the organoid. Here, what I'm showing you, this uh, cellular heterogeneity that I showed in, in patients are also seen within the organoid. So we can have both the epithelial, epithelial mesenchymal transition and mesenchymal cell states. And more robustly, this is something uh, that tells the fidelity of our model. When we compare the cancer cells in the patient tissue to the cancer cells within the organoid using single cell genomics, we can estimate how similar they are. So some of our models are very high fidelity. They look very similar to the patient cancer cells. Some of them are less, but still there is, uh, there is, good, uh, sorry, there is good correlation. And so uh, here you can see, like, this is a very nice high fidelity model. This is not so nice, but it's at least better, much better than sticking some cancer cells on a plastic dish and, you know, like studying the cancer's ability to grow on a plastic dish in the context of like treating that disease. So it's not perfect, but it's better than the current uh, uh, gold standard. And so in, in the final few minutes, I will highlight how now we are applying this information that we learned from studying cancer and normal into endometriosis. So as I've shown you, we, we are really uh, capable of growing organoids over a long time, making them high fidelity. So we wanted to model endometriosis on a dish by changing the uh, 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 microenvironment of the cells that we grow on a dish. And here we change the extracellular matrix. And as you can see, even by the appearance, as the changes in extracellular matrix and growth uh, conditions, you can make these cells look like more migratory and more invasive. And when you do gene expression profiling, you can see some genes that are involved in inflammation and migration and it t telling us that maybe these cells are starting to behave like um, uh, endometriosis. Of course, it's not real true endometriotic lesion, but when we do single cell analysis, we can see uh, several cell states that look similar to the ones that are defined within endometriosis. And so this is very exciting for us because we can compare these uh, uh, different cell states in different growth conditions, and potentially that will now open new avenues for us where we can test small molecule drugs or other type of um, uh, epithelial intrinsic or uh, you know, uh, tissue intrinsic factors. It's not capable for us to target neurons and fibroblasts and other crucial mediators of uh, endometriosis, but at least it's a good start. And we've been you know, trying to collaborate with other uh, leaders in that field. You know, with us, we are trying to figure out how we can incorporate st stroma in this condition. We are very interested in metabolism and how metabolic metabolic factors are involved in that process. So this is a good start, but it's, uh, you know, like definitely, uh, it's just the beginning of the journey. And so when we look at um, compare, uh, comparing um, the gene expression programs, we see a lot of uh, uh, genes that are involved in inflammation or inflammatory processes of endometrium, including endometriosis. And with that, I would love to thank the fearless team members who have been doing this amazing work I'm very fortunate to have them in my lab and also wonderful collaborators that I have both at Cold Spring Harbor and uh, in other places, especially at Northwell. And uh, we've been uh, uh, very fortunate to be part of the Endometriosis Foundation family. Um, you know, I, I met Dr. Sechkin last year and I attended the Endometriosis uh, Medical Conference and that facilitated a lot of collaborations uh, within that field and, you know, we can only solve that puzzle by working together and collaborating, and I'm very happy to be here and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Do we have any discussion? Do, is, it the, is it? I'm done with the thing, and then we'll do discussion later, right? Okay, cool. <laughs>